Tonight on Nation to Nation, the new Indigenous Services Minister is introduced to the Assembly of First Nations. Mark Miller promises that Canada will compensate children in care in due course. So we have that track record with respect to uh, the Indian Day School settlements, the residential, days, the residential school settlements and, uh, and the 60s school. But Cindy Blackstock still doesn't trust the government's track record. And even as a repeat offender against First Nations children, it still wants to call the shots on what's going to happen with these kids. Another hot topic at the Assembly was Child Welfare Reform, or Bill C-92. But First Nations control needs funding. Definitely let Canada know that there's going to be a need of a roughly about $3.5 billion over the next five years to implement C-92. I'm Todd Lamoran, and welcome to Nation to Nation. From the floor of the AFN Special Assembly and from unceded Algonquin and Shinabeg territory, Mark Miller is the new Indigenous Services Minister, having been on the job just a few weeks. However, Minister Miller was Parliamentary Secretary to Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Carolyn Bennett and is no stranger to Indigenous issues. And there's a lot to talk about. So let's get to it. Welcome to Nation to Nation, Minister Miller. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me on, have hanging me on in your show in the past. It's been, a, it's been a pleasure really to answer your questions and to have a vigorous debate with colleagues. Well, it'll just be uh, with me this time. Uh, and we'll start with uh, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. And I heard what you said in your speech earlier. Uh, are you going to finally sit down and negotiate a settlement, a compensation deal? Well, look, Todd, this is a, it's, it's an extremely important question. We're talking fundamentally about children, uh, children that suffered uh, discrimination over what the Human Rights Tribunal uh, covers as a 10-year period. Uh, what we've engaged to do and what I've, what I've uh, asked my officials to do is to sit down with stakeholders uh, representatives of families and children and, and, and to find out a way to move forward and to ensure that compensation is reflective of the prejudice, that we have uh, a model that works towards addressing the systemic discrimination uh, and also a model that achieves individual compensation. And, uh, in that optic, we've, uh, we've proposed to enlarge the group to uh, what is no, no, it should be not foreign to your listeners and viewers that uh, there is a class action with Xavier Mishu as the principal litigant that goes and enlarges the group of children that were discriminated against to a 15-year period that precedes the Human Rights Tribunal decision and, and with respect to which the Human Rights Tribunal doesn't address. So we're looking at it from uh, a global and comprehensive perspective with the view of moving towards a, a solution that is just fair and equitable for the children and their families. Uh, the minister, similar to the Minister of Justice, will be instructing his uh, officials to, to start those discussions. We, we always aim uh, towards, towards moving towards uh, a settlement that, that, that is fair and respectful. But there's a lot of work to, to do. There are there's sort of two parallel tracks. There's uh, the June, the, rather the January 29th date that we need to uh, meet in order to satisfy the, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal order uh, and deadline to come forward with the parties with a with a model that works. And then uh, a parallel process that that takes a step back and says, let's look at the whole, uh, let's look at the whole class of litigants and uh, children that have been discriminated against by by successive governments and, and come up with a model of compensation that addresses uh, fair, just and equitable compensation. Uh, you mentioned the January 29th uh, deadline. Uh, can you still negotiate with that, with the Caring Society, with the Assembly of First Nations, if you still have or are pursuing a judicial review of all that? Well, look, two things there. There's, uh, it isn't a luxury uh, to comply with court orders. Uh, we found ourselves in a very, very difficult situation of being in an election when, when, when the initial uh, order and judgment came through. Uh, we face an appeal now that addresses uh, issues of jurisdiction, uh, complex legal issues, no doubt, uh, but also issues that we have with respect to the compensation model. And uh, while these are legitimate in our views, uh, we can never lose track of, uh, of the children that are involved, and that is the optic that we need to approach. And this is why we have these parallel processes of engaging and, and, and discussing uh, the compensation models that need to be discussed. We have that track record with respect to uh, the Indian Day School settlements, the residential, days, the residential school settlements, and, uh, and the 60 Scoop settlements that we've acted quite pro promptly and quickly on. Um, so there are there are paths to moving forward and addressing both that systemic uh, discrimination and, and individual compensation. 
Uh, you mentioned the word optic a couple of times, though. I mean, the optics on this uh, don't look good. I mean, uh, uh, especially on social media, there's a lot of people complaining, well, how can you do this to children? Uh, why not settle sooner rather than later? Why not settle uh, with the with the January 29th deadline, settle and, and, and also do the other uh, aspect that you talked about? Look, my concern in that of the governments has always been the children involved and, and, and reaching a, a just a, an equitable compensation model and, 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 and resolution that, uh, that, 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 is, that, that needs to be uh, properly addressed. And so when we, when we engage uh, with our officials and instruct them to move forward uh, and talk to the council of principal litigants, uh, when we tell them to talk to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the caring society, uh, among others, uh, that is with that optic of, of coming up with solutions and models that, that work and address uh, what the court has rightly identified as, uh, as discrimination. Uh, I'm going to move on to Bill C-92 now, which is uh, supposed to be uh, implemented on January 1st, less than a month now. Uh, but you know the criticisms, uh, especially at a place like Manitoba, the CFS minister, Heather Stevenson, uh, doesn't know the details. Uh, well, how can this be rolled out when uh, so many people are kind of ignorant about what's actually coming down the pike? Well, look, on, on January of this uh, coming year, uh, Indigenous communities will be able to exercise an inherent right that uh, a lot of us Canadians take for granted, which is jurisdiction control over their own children. Uh, that, uh, that right w will exist as of, as of January twenty. 2020, uh, it is a fundamental right. Uh, the implementation that you discuss uh, is, is, is optional. It is, it is exceedingly important for communities that are ready to exercise and draw down that jurisdiction. And in my department stands ready to help and assist as the case may be. Um, there's definitely concern, and I echo that concern. Uh, and that's why I'm one of my principal focuses, ensuring that, that we have the resources available uh, to assist communities that want to draw down on that jurisdiction. Now, when we talk about that, we talk about a holistic approach. Uh, what needs to be addressed? It, it, it can range from issues to infrastructure, to housing, to addressing um, uh, renewing family ties. Uh, all these things that, uh, that that we need to address and and have, have torn communities apart in the past. So, uh, yes, I share that concern, and, and I won't hide that. But um, but we're ready to work forward and making sure that, that this legislation is is implemented in a fashion for communities that choose to exercise that jurisdiction. Now it does uh, roll over and there is some work that has to be done with provinces because there are uh, elements of, of, of the jurisdiction that touch provinces when we talk about uh, the best interests of the child. Those are those are principles that exist in, 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 the, in the courts of law, um, but they need to be properly exercised by Indigenous communities that choose to draw down on that jurisdiction. Now, uh, somebody who's uh, talked about this, uh, he's actually up on stage right now as we speak, is uh, Manitoba Regional Chief Kevin Hart. And he came out in a report that says that we need $3.5 billion over five years, or you're just setting up communities up for failure. Uh, I know the budget discussions are probably haven't even started yet, but is that something that uh, your department is going to be looking at, is to get some statutory funding for Bill C-92? So the number that you quoted to me is, is a number that has been, uh, that, that has been uh, reiterated to me by uh, National Chief Perry Bellegarde, and uh, I, I will seek to get some clarity on that number. Uh, again, it ranges into a, a number of categories that, that deal with the holistic approach to ensuring that uh, that, that children are properly cared for. Uh, so, again, I have a large department and, and it is ready to help and this is one of the major pieces of legislation that were demanded principally by Indigenous communities uh, but championed by our government and uh, we will work hard to make sure it's implemented properly for communities that choose to do so. Uh, finally, I'm going to ask you about uh, uh, earlier we heard from Chief Rudy Turtle and he wants a mercury treatment centre uh, we know what happened with your predecessor, a deal couldn't be struck. Um, is it true that the sticking point is uh, they want an actual treatment centre, but the government of Canada is only proposing an assisted living centre? No. Uh, and out of respect for Chief Turtle, I, I, I am going to sit down with him tomorrow uh, and have that discussion with him, uh, with the personnel that he chooses to have with him and with, with mine. I want to uh, 
engage with them and, and, and see how we can move this forward. It is a priority of mine, it's a priority of the Prime Minister's, it's the priority yeah, of, you, of this uh, government uh, to get this done. Uh, there's some work to do to move forward, uh, but um, without having had that discussion and out of courtesy to Chief Turtle, uh, I'll probably have more to say to that uh, tomorrow. Okay, because uh, of course it's been two years, uh, another predecessor, Jane Philpott, promised it uh, two years ago, um, and nothing is, I, I mean, after you have that discussion with Chief Turtle, or we're going to have an announcement, there'll be a press conference where you, money is allocated and a shovel can go under the ground. My objective, Todd, is not to have press conferences. It's to ensure that uh, a treatment centre uh, is, is put in place in Glassy Narrows uh, according to the community needs. I, I need to have that discussion with Chief Turtle uh, out of a courtesy to him. So very difficult for me at this stage to address uh, what he stated publicly already because I haven't had that engagement, but my team has reached out and I, and I will have a sit down with them. Because uh, I'm assuming your team has had that. They've had these discussions, obviously, uh, it's the same team probably with your predecessors, so they've had these discussions, so uh, I guess, what is the sticking point? Why can't we get this done? Well, again, tomorrow? we're going to have that discussion and see if there actually is a sticking point. Um, um, both of us have been in elections uh, and uh, some time has elapsed. But clearly, uh, my, 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 uh, my department is laser focused on this issue. Okay, uh, I didn't get time uh, to talk about education, health, water, uh, a lot of things, uh, but I'll have to say that for another time. Yep, I'll get my mandate letter out, Todd, and uh, we can talk about every single item, and I'd be glad to come back and discuss it. Okay, well, we'll definitely hold you that to that. Thank you, Mr. It. Miller. We'll have more after a short break. Welcome back. Before the break, I spoke to Minister Miller about children and child welfare. And my next guests have a lot to say about the Minister's comments. Join me now is Caring Society Executive Director Cindy Blackstock and Manitoba Regional Chief Kevin Hart. Welcome to Nation to Nation, both of you. Welcome. Thank you. Ms. Blackstock, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, you obviously heard Minister Miller's comments and you heard uh, what Attorney, da uh, Attorney General David Lametti had to say about the Human Rights uh, Tribunal and its compensation order. It sounds like they want to set it aside to uh, include a bigger group to have a bigger settlement a la the 60s scoop. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is that they have a legal order to pay compensation to victims that have had their families unnecessarily separated and in some cases sadly children die. They can pay that $40,000 and not put those families on hold while they deal with the other settlement. This, what they're proposing to do is say to those families, oh no, you've got to wait longer while we figure out something that might be better but we don't know will be better and that's wrong. Do you think it's just about maybe they want to mitigate how big it is? Maybe instead of 40000 they're going to you know, cut a deal for 20, who knows yeah, what they're doing. Yeah, well, that may be what they're aiming for. I have said publicly, this money is not mine. It belongs to the children and the families. I'm not in any position to negotiate down the amount or try to leave people out that the tribunal said should be in the decision. I'm prepared to follow the law, and Canada should be prepared to follow the law too. But right now it's acting as if it's above the law, and even as a repeat offender against First Nations children, it still wants to call the shots on what's going to happen with these kids. And that's a problem. Chief Hart, I'm going to get you, you obviously heard the same minister's comments. I'll get your take on the whole situation. For, for myself as the national portfolio holder here at the Assembly of First Nations, it's simply unfair and acceptable what Canada is trying to propose. You know, we partnered with the Caring Society for our children and we, we've gone to that long battle. We have our champion here when it comes to our First Nation children in care. And with the uh, original tribu tribunal orders and everything that has happened since that time, you know, they're still under the order of compensation and I have to stand fully with that in partnership with my Cindy Blackstock and the Caring Society because we're here for our First Nations children first and foremost. And when you hear uh, Canada and uh, Minister Bennett, for example, and Justice Ometti saying that we want to get it right, you know, you look at the history of Canada in the last 150 years, you know, and you hear that now that they want to get it right, well, that should have been done 150 years ago. I'm going to stay with you on more about getting it right. Um, 
are they getting it right or wrong with how Bill C-92 is being rolled out? But a lot of criticism, especially from your home province, uh, the CFS minister there has, doesn't know what the details are. What's going on with this with this legislation's rollout? Well, as you see, uh, moving forward, you know, obviously there is a fiscal component that was not attached with C-92. And through our pre-budget submission at the Assembly of First Nations, we definitely let Canada know that there's going to be a need of a roughly about $3.5 billion over the next five years to implement C-92. You see the controversy, of course, that's happening across this country, not only in my region in Manitoba, but, um, you know, there's different uh, political organizations that have their... Uh, different positions and that's included here in, in my region in Manitoba where you know the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs through the Women's Council has their position but we I also have to listen to the positions of the Southern Chiefs organization and the Chiefs in the North through MKO because I was elected by the 63 First Nation Chiefs who are sovereign chiefs of sovereign nations that through C-92 is going to give them for the first time the ability to create tribal law that would take precedence over federal and provincial law. And, you know, that's historic in itself when we look at child welfare because there's other things that affect us more west when we talk about the NRTA and other things that so for us exercising our jurisdiction our sovereignty to create our own tribal law is precedent setting and historic in itself because we get to create our laws that would take paramountcy over federal provincial law. Uh, Ms. Blackstock again about Bill C-92 I know the uh, role, role rollout hasn't been what everybody wants but in the, uh, the long run uh, won't this be good for children and child children in care it'll be good for children in care if there's adequate funding attached to be able to develop the laws and the institutions in order to give effect to first nations laws Right now, Canada is promising nothing, and it's important to know that during the process of C-92, all of us together told the government that there needed to be resources, that that's part of jurisdiction. And the federal government said, oh no, we'll deal with that later. And all of this is happening within the context of the tribunal, where Canada is still not in full compliance with that decision despite 10 legal orders. So when we think about an individual First Nation trying to negotiate with Canada about funding in that context, without the support of those, all those lawyers and everything else that we've had, it really makes you worry that it won't end up with the supports that their families deserve and their nation deserves. Uh, now, uh, Chief Hart, you were there when Mary Ellen Turpel gave her presentation and it sound, sounded pretty positive, some of the stuff she said. You know, she especially said that you're going to have really strong muscle now going forward. Uh, so I suppose maybe five, ten years from now, we might actually have that muscle? Well, it's going to be historic, like I said again, when it takes the paramountcy of us creating our own tribal law. That's been a long-standing uh, argument for us as First Nation is to recognize our tribal laws and our, our, and our own ways of making our own laws that would take precedence over uh, federal provincial law. Before contact, we had a government in place, we had clan systems in place too and such, we had decision making tables where women and men and elders and children were involved at all those decision making processes. Of course, under this colonial system, you look at what's happening here when we have, of course, what they call Indian Act chiefs that are elected by members of a nation, but you have to remember that those chiefs that are elected by sovereign nations are those very spokespersons. They speak for the rights holders. They're the ones that are speaking on behalf of their children too and they have every right to exercise your ability when they talk about the jurisdiction and sovereignty over their children moving forward in child welfare. One of the key pieces of that though Todd hmm. is unless the federal government deals with the housing crisis, yep. deals with the addictions and the mental health and trauma, deals with the poverty, then we're not going to be able to see families in a healthy place so they can thrive. And that's why the Spirit Bear Plan is so important to the success of C92. We need to get rid of these inequalities, get, you know, get rid of kids go attending schools of black mold, get rid of communities without water. Um, if C92 goes into that environment without those things addressed, then I think that if it can really, we have a high risk of it being offloading and not an uplifting of First Nations children. I think uh, Mary Ellen Turpel uh, admitted that uh, one of the provisions of C-92 is to get rid of uh, apprehensions of birth. 
but uh, she said that uh, on January 1st, I can guarantee you that's still going to happen. It sounds like there's still a lot of education that has to go on, not only with the agencies, but with prov provincial partners as well. Well, one of the things too I want to say is uh, that I'm not against, I'm against a complete ban of birth alerts. In some cases, they're needed, but they need to be regulated and only used in a very rare circumstances where children are really at risk. Um, but the other piece that we need to think about is, yeah, the piece that you're talking about. We have legal aid lawyers who don't know about this. We have courts that don't know if they can hear these cases that normally hear about it. We have families that aren't aware of it. We have youth in care who aren't aware of it. There's been no effort by the federal government to educate people and say, get ready, this is what's going to happen. Or even on the First Nations side, there's a requirement to notify uh, First Nations governments about significant decisions for children, but there's no funding to make sure there's somebody in the nation who can receive those notices and be able to work on behalf of the nation for that child. Uh, Chief Hart, uh, based on what you heard, I mean, who should be doing the educating here? It sounds like it might be offloaded to First Nations, but it should probably be the, the federal government educating all these stakeholders about what's happening on January 1st. Well, you know, for us as a legislative working group, our National Advisory Council and that, we have great people like Cindy Blackstock and others who have helped us along the way. And yes, we have to go into each of those respected regions, listen to everything that's very unique. We already have done that at the Legislative Working Group and our National Advisory Council where we have chiefs as well as technicians that have been working with us at that level. And we have to go back and then you hear recently with the Premier's meeting and that you're getting pushed back from the provinces and like the sky is falling. And you know, that goes to show that they have to answer to voters who are non-native voters, who are the ones that are operating the very industries that are taking care of our children right now and confining them in these spaces. And you know, I always argued this whole time that the child welfare system that we have currently right now in Canada is just a legalized form of the residential school that further is um, colonizing, assimilating and segregating our children away from the nations. And that's what was so important about Bill C-92 is giving that authority and autonomy back to the nations through the chiefs and the councils and especially when we talk about our mothers and grandmothers because there has to be so, many, so much uh, reconciliation done on the loss of life, for example, because families have been split up because of that disparity where we've lost parents and grandparents and such because of addictions or suicide, because of their children and their grandchildren being ripped from their arms. You know, those are things that have to be reconciled immediately by Canada as well, too, moving forward. You know, they keep talking about reconciliation and moving forward, but we need to see real action when it comes to our most precious gifts, and that's our children. Well, we could continue talking about this, that's for sure, but uh, we'll have to save more for another day. I want to thank you both for coming on here today. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. We'll have more after another short break. Welcome back. That's our show from the floor of the AFN Special Assembly. But before we go, we'll end with the British Columbia Premier John Horgan being honoured for his government's passing of UNDRIP. He's the first sitting Premier to address the Assembly. I'm Todd Lamoran. Thanks for watching. Our nation. Honor song. Nation. Chanson d'honneur.